Well, let's get into it, man. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are to us, Lord. And we pray right now that you would first uh, forgive us of our sins, Lord. We need to come before you um, clean, and, Lord, most of us are not. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us. Lord, we ask that you would clear our mind, uh, Lord, of the things of the day, that we would be focused and centered only on your word and only on what you want to teach us tonight, that we walk out of here with something new, something that we want to just, we're, we're all seeking you and asking you so many questions in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we know that uh, through your word is how we're going to hear it. So, Lord, remove our thoughts and all the drama of our day and replace it, Lord, now with your Holy Spirit and the things you have to share with us tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. There's a whole lot within this chapter. Uh, and so, it would be better just to piece it together. I know I probably should have that a little bit better planned, but usually we do a chapter. So, But then it, every so often you have these chapters where you want to take your time and go through it. And this is one of them. Uh, and as we're going to see tonight, there's a lot of different reasons why we're going to take our time to go through it. Because there's a lot of important messages, I think, practical messages that are going to come out just in these first 11 verses. And that's what we're going to go through. Um, so for most of us, we're usually here every week. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to, we've watched David become king. Uh, we watched him continually learn that a part of his relationship with God and as part of his calling, because uh, we talked a little bit about that last week about the calling, he, David quickly learned, and I think this is, not, I, no, I shouldn't use the word quickly. He, he's been learning all throughout this time that he's going to have to have a relationship with God to where he's talking with God on a continual basis. David is always going to need to inquire of the Lord. And that's one point that God has made very evident to the reader and very evident to, to David. David needs to know as he's going to be king of Israel, as he's going to lead God's people, that he needs to know he always has to go to the Lord with everything. He's going to always have to inquire of the Lord. And I really like that, that we've been watching that happen because I think many of us in this room, that's kind of where we're at. You know, we're kind of like, man, Lord, seriously, I got to go to you for everything. You start to get to the point where you're like, I go to the Lord every minute of the day. You know, some guys are every minute of the day. Uh, and, and that's true because really we, every step we take, there's usually something we want to bring before the Lord. And a lot of times it's because of spiritual warfare. It's just because of the work that God's doing in our lives. We've got to go to him every day. And so now we're going to start getting into uh, just sort of watching everything else unfold. David becoming the king. King David. How, how is it now in the calling time? In the time period of where he's to himself, he's going to be doing what God has made him to do. Uh, really neat place, though, to be, I think. We all got to do a self-examination uh, in that. Are you fulfilling the calling that God has made you for? You know, that's, that's a place we want to catch up here to David. Uh, and I encourage every one of you, I, I'm always receiving it from the Lord as far as just being reminded. I, we went and read this morning through, how many of you guys have read uh, Calvary Chapel Distinctives? Anybody read the Distinctives? Really? Oh, man. Uh, I really encourage you guys to read Calvary Chapel Distinctives. It's, a, it's a, uh, written by Chuck Smith. It's a book that talks about Calvary Chapel Distinctives, what it is, who we are as Calvary Chapel, as far as what we believe and not who we are as like a cult, but who we are as far as what we believe and, and, our found, and sort of Chuck Smith's founding principles of how he wanted Calvary Chapels, or at least let me rephrase that, how the Lord directed him to, to lead the church, uh, Calvary Chapel. And I, I've read it before, actually a few times, and we're going over it again with Pastor Jeff. He wants to take the pastor through it again just to remind us, because Pastor Jeff, and I agree with him, believes that we're living in a time where the churches are changing like crazy. You know, different doctrines are coming up, different things are happening in churches, even Calvary chapels, you know, uh, where it's kind of some of, some of these churches are, are veering away from what, uh, they, what, what the, how they were founded in God's word. I think there's a Calvary Chapel that calls their pastor's wives pastors and it's getting kind of weird, you know, and so they're just reminding, kind of going, hey, you know, this is how we were founded. This is what God blessed back then. And so the first part, part of the distinctives is 
the calling. And I love that because Chuck Smith talks about his calling, you know, how he went to four years of Bible school and he felt like as soon as he got out of Bible school, he was gonna, everybody was going to be waiting for him, you know, ready to, to, to receive what he had to give. And, and in fact, his testimony, you could read all about it in the distinctives. It's completely not that. As soon as he graduated school, uh, he said he realized that he wasn't going to make it as a pastor and he needed to get a job. And, and he gives his story of how 17 years went by and then he finally gets into the ministry of what we know as Calvary Chapel. Uh, so he really, though, camps on through that time period in his life how he really had to make sure he was called by God. And I think a lot of us as Christians, we go, the enemy likes to throw that in our minds a lot to, uh, to make you ask that yourself, are you called? Are you, are you even called to do what you're doing in terms of Christianity? Many of us are, we know we're to be saved or that's cool. We're saved. Hey, all right. We became a Christian. We walked down or whatever. But then comes the calling. What do you, and I think, I, I would hope to think that a lot of this time that we've been going through first and now second Samuel, a lot of us here would be thinking those things. What was my calling? You know, a lot of now I'm noticing we have different group leaders and 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 because in this ministry, that's kind of what we want to do is just uh, get to the point where it would be neat to have one on one, you know, this room filled with just one leader, one person <laughs> to where we're getting some discipleship going on. Uh, so the idea is to raise people up. What is your calling? What has God called you to do? We see Jeremy and, you know, with the worship and the team that that's worshiping there, they feel a calling to worship. Uh, but it's very important that we kind of solidify what God has called you to do. What kind of leader has God called you to be? Who has he placed under you in terms of family or in terms of relationships? Who are you over? Who, who, who are you called to? And so, because now we're going to get into what, it's, what it is to be in the calling. And we're going to, it's not everything that we would hope it to be, I think, sometimes. Uh, man, I made it. I'm a Christian. I cleaned up. I feel I'm called to serve the Lord. And then all of a sudden, uh, you think, okay, cool. Then everything's going to go smooth, you know. Um, but w I think one thing we all can agree with is it doesn't go smooth. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a screwed up world. And we live in dark times. And for the Christian, you, you, we couldn't have been placed here at any worse times than now, <laughs> basically. basically. For the Christian today that we are, we're up against... Uh, we're up against uh, carnality. We're up against compromise. We're up against uh, just a, uh, a mundane Christianity. We're up against all these. Christianity is very difficult today, man. And then at the same time, we got every wind of doctrine buzzing through our ears. And then, you know, we have to challenge ourselves to be rooted and grounded in God's word because you want to. And a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight is how the flesh really wants to get involved in like an emotional thing. Emotional Christianity. You know, as we're going to see David got emotional a little bit. And it's a scary thing, the emotional wind of doctrine today. The enemy trying to convince people to just feed off of their emotions and the flesh. Uh, Calvary chapels are actually getting a little boring these days because all we do is teach the word. And people want it more than that. They want, they want more than that. And that's, not, and that's not what we need to get into. So let's get into it and see how we're going to watch David at the beginning of the calling. So chapter 6, verse 1. It says, and David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 of them. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. Now, if you got a name like that, it's worth looking into. What is this? Why, why is the writer drawing that type of attention to the ark of God? And this is going to be our sort of foundation for what we're going to get into right now. Uh, over in, in uh, Exodus, turn there with me because we might spend a minute there. Exodus chapter 25. What is the ark of God? Most of us know the ark of God for being, uh, well, a little Bible quiz. What did the ark, what did the ark have in it? Anybody? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Out of all you guys, I heard all three things. Yeah, we, we kind of know, the ark is kind of known for having the, the rod, the, uh, the jar, whatever you want to call it, and the tablets, the stone tablets, the commandments on them. Um, and so, you know, you get this picture. Has everybody in here seen that? The old, uh, 
uh, what was it called? The, with Moses leading the people out of Israel, the old, who was the actor? Charles. Yeah, yeah, the old one. You know, good picture of, of the Exodus. You know, I like that movie. Um, so we have our, our mindset of, of God and the pictures of what we know to be God, and especially when it comes to talking about the Ark of the Covenant, you know. Then you got Indiana Jones, who does another good job about the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think they're pretty close theologically. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we see the Ark of God in our minds and, and what it is. But really, what was the Ark of God to be? What, why does he say that dwelleth between the cherubims? What's the importance of that? So Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, it says... 25 verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. To catch you up to speed, this is God talking to his people, saying this is what I want from you guys. Let them make me a sanctuary because I want to dwell with them. I want to dwell on earth with my people. According to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So he's saying, now I'm going to tell you guys how to make this place that I want to hang out with. God gave them such clear direction on what to do. And he's saying, I want to live down there on earth, and this is what I want you to do. So first, this is his first line of order, line of business here. Verse 10, you shall make an ark of wood, or the, the shitin wood, or whatever they call it. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and the cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So he gives a specific way how, how he wants this thing built. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, it's got to be pure gold, uh, within and without, all the way through, uh, and you shall overlay it, and it shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. So for the next few verses, he just describes on how he wants the ark to be. He, very, very specific. God is a God of order, and I love that. He gives him very clear building instructions on how to make this thing. But the verse I want to point out, look at 21 and 22. He said, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, which we all know the three things we said. And there, now listen to this. And there, where? Once you build this thing, once you put these cherubims, once you do this mercy seat, once you do all this stuff, right there I will meet with thee. Where? And I will commune with thee. So he's going to meet with them and talk with them at the same time. From the, above the mercy seat. From where? Between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. Amazing scripture there. God is very clear to the children of Israel on how to build this ark and what's going to happen once they do. He says as soon as you build this ark and you build these cherubims, you know, they look like the angels with their wings out like that. And you do the mercy seat. Right there is where I'm going to meet with you. And I'm going to talk to you there, as a matter of fact. I mean, talk about wanting a source to communicate to God. I mean, talk about wanting, hey, Lord, if we had a, were able to have the microphone and a speaker down here on earth, where would you want it? He says, right there. That's where I want it. Right above the ark. Right there on the lid of that thing. If I had a picture, you know, we'd be able to see it. But a very, very clear picture on, on how he's going to do that. And why, why he wants it. Look at Numbers chapter 7. Uh, uh, Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. It says, number 7, 89 says, And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from the mercy seat. See, he heard the voice coming straight out of there, man. Straight out of this place that God said, that's where I'm going to meet you. That was upon the ark of testimony from between the two cherubims. And he spake to him. Now, what exactly was going to be the actual day-to-day -day process that they would do here on the mercy seat between the cherubims where God would meet them? Over in, uh, and I'm bouncing around right now to make a point. Uh, over in Leviticus, uh, turn back a little bit to Leviticus chapter 16, and look at verse 14 with me. See, there was more that was going to take place on this thing. It says on, in verse 14 in Leviticus chapter 16, And he shall take the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger upon what? The mercy seat. 
eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So now we got the Lord really, really describing what's to take place on top of this ark. God was going to speak to them from there, commune with them, meet with them. They were to sprinkle the blood. Why were they sprinkling the blood on, on the mercy seat between the cherubims? Because this is, was their way of sacrifice. This is, was the atoning for the sins of the people. Okay? This, this, this process, which you could read more about in Leviticus, was for the atonement of sin in the most holy place. And they were supposed to have a very detailed process on how this was going to take place. So God would eventually forgive the people of their sins. Because of the sprinkling of the sacrifice on the mercy seat between the cherubs where he would speak to them and commune with them. And ultimately, this is where he would forgive the people. So really interesting connection in the New Testament where we have Jesus being described as the propitiation. The word mercy seat actually means propitiation. So when you look at the connection between the word mercy seat and what we're dealing with, where they're sprinkling the blood, and then you look at Jesus in the New Testament called the propitiation, or in other words, the mercy seat, you see the connection, don't you? The forgiveness of sins on the mercy seat between the cherubs, the forgiveness of sins from the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In the same way that they would commune and meet with God on top of the ark through these processes that God gave them, is the same way that God has given to us very specifically on our communication to, to him and our communion to him through his son, the final sacrifice, Jesus Christ. It's very specific. There's not too many ways to see that. The same way that he drew out the specifics of the ark is the same way that he draws out the, the specifics for us through Christ. We don't need to be seekers anymore. <laughs> you see, we don't have to go about and figure out how can I commune with God? How can I make contact with him through the, you know, through the heavens? Do I, they have these rocks in Arizona. You can probably do it from there uh, where the magnetic pull of the earth, the, they call it the male and the female pulse. Weird. And I don't even need to go any further. But you go to these rocks in Sedona, I think it is. <laughs> these hippies are. And they still live there. And this is where they meet with God. But... So many people go on this seeking journey or this quest to how can I commune with God? Well, for the Old Testament people, they had it real simply. They knew, they knew it was through the mercy seat here. For us today, it's the same. It's through Jesus Christ, okay, the forgiveness of sins. And this makes the sinner feel good. <laughs> Why? Because they went to the mercy seat for the atonement of sin. They didn't go just to hang out. They went to be forgiven. And that's what made them clean. For us today, for those of you who are sinners in this room, Pound it. Because you know what? We meet the Lord at, at the cross. Because we go to him for forgiveness. We go to him humbly. We go to him saying, Lord, I, I just can't perfect myself. I can't do it in the flesh. I want to talk with you, God. I want to know what you have for my life. But you know, I just can't figure it out. So how about this? How about, Lord, just forgive me and I humble myself before you. Because when you find yourself there is where you find yourself at the propitiation. Jesus Christ. The mediator between God and man. And there's no other way to get there. There's no other way to commune with God. As, as often as I go berserk about how I want to hear from God right now, I'm always reminded that it's simple. You hear through God, you hear from God through his son that he sent, through the mediator. That's how we hear from him. And how do I make contact? How do I make myself present to Jesus? Well, easy. You go humbly before him at the throne. You go, on, you, you go bowed before him in forgiveness of sin. We don't go to him perfected. We don't go to him going, I got this now. Jesus, what's up? Now I can stand up. Let's look at each other eye to eye. That doesn't work that way. We don't see him eye to eye. Though I'm not getting doctrinally weird because he is our, a friend. And, you know, my point, my point being is that we go, we go to him broken. We go to him broken. How many of you guys ever read The Calvary Road? A few of you guys. Another one of those books I, I really recommend. The Calvary Road really gives a good picture of what it is to be broken. What it is to be broken before the Lord continually. Always just saying, Lord, meet me at the same place. And that place is just through humility. So the ark of God is not just a box that you get to transport any way you want to. The ark of God was where he would meet his people. He gave specifics. You guys remember the story of Joshua, right? When they transported it. You remember he had, he had the Levites. They were carrying them with the poles and everything. And he says, as soon as they put their feet in the water, what would happen? 
the water opened up for them and they crossed Jordan. Remember? We went through that in Joshua. There was a very, and then a matter of fact, he said, you stand afar off too, by the way. Yeah, they had to stand, what was it? Anybody know the exact space? Like, huh? So it was 2,000 feet or half mile or something crazy like that, where they had to stand afar off. They couldn't even be up against it. So there was a very specific way to transport the ark. Now, that builds the ark thing, okay? Uh, now we ask ourselves, because these next few verses we're going to read uh, should be real simple, a real simple process here. David uh, wants to get the ark. That's what he wants to do, okay? But what happens? So, verse 3. They set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the son of Abinadab, drave the new cart. Now, mistake number one, the ark was never to be transported on a cart. God made that clear on how to transport the ark. It was to be through the poles, going through the little things that were made on it, the golden, whatever they're called, hooks, the rings. And they were to put it on their shoulders, as the priest did for, for Joshua. And they were to transport the ark this way. And only, only the priest can do it. And for Bible people, what, what were the priests that could do it? The Levites. the Levites. So, they put it on this cart. Okay, David, right now, I think he's moving. He's, again, it's, he's king. Right? He's excited, man. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. He, he's excited to be king. It's his, his, his calling. His, he finally got Judah and all Israel. They're all, were, remember, they made a league with him. So he's like, the next step, man, is to bring the ark. This is to, I'm, I'm putting things in order now. I'm going to bring God back to the scene. Is there anything wrong with that? Do we, do we see anything wrong with that? No, I mean, hey, we're excited. God called you. He, he selected you to, for a certain work. Well, it's like the guys who get saved and, and the woman, the wife's already saved. And then the husband gets saved. The wife goes, yes, he's going to, you know, when my dad, I remember when I was young and I wish he never did this. When he got saved, he took all my mom's old records and just smashed them all up. Boom. Bob Marley. Boom. Boom. Tina Turner. Boom. All these different records that my mom had and third world. Anybody heard third world? Yeah. yeah, boom, cracked that one too with a screwdriver. And he broke all the records because he's like, well, this is, we're changed in the house, you know. That's it, I'm excited. You know, I'm saved now, honey, and I'm not going to get drunk and beat you anymore, you know, kind of thing. He's going to change his life. And I remember going, wow, my dad's going to change, man, from this crazy dad, I remember, to somebody who's going to walk with the Lord. My dad was radical. And, and some of us have, have that testimony when we get saved, we get radical. You know, and you just, you, you just go gun ho man. You flip upside down, you know. You paint your house pink instead of, you know, brown or whatever. And, and you're, you just want to make the stand and the statement to everybody who knows you, you know. And, and you get excited. And there's nothing wrong with that because you're saying, I want to bring God. But the one thing that we get here as Christians today is then we get, get into God's word. That's why Calvary chapels, they emphasize the reading of the word because they say, get into the word. Because it's through God's word, he's going to raise you up, he's going to teach you, he's going to show you how to be. So David is excited and he wants to bring God back to the scene. And they brought it, verse 4, out of the house of Abinadab, which was in Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even harps and psalteries, and on the timbrels and the, the cornets and the cymbals. So again, the music's playing. You know, you guys know that's a symbol of just complete uh, worship. And so they're, they're worshiping God. They're excited about what's going on. And it's interesting how emotions are so associated to worship, isn't it? How sometimes... Uh, churches could just have a whole straight up worship service instead of a Bible study because it feels better. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to worship the whole night, man. I don't even want to get in the Bible because I like to worship. I want to blow my hands up, get into it. Matter of fact, I'm going to get on my knees now. and I'm going to cry too because this song is the best one. You know, we get into the worship and we get into the music and we get into the emotions of it. Unfortunately, that's, that's not always the way it's supposed to be. God has... A very specific order because he has spelled out a very specific way to himself he has spelled it out for us very clearly he doesn't he doesn't say to do this 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 and he you know hey it's through my son it's through Jesus Christ it's through forgiveness of sins okay it's through it's through the word of God 
It's through communion. It's through fellowship. It's through prayer. It gives us all the channels. But the flesh is always in opposition because that stuff becomes mundane. And who wants to stop and think anyway? You know what I mean? Why would David want to have to stop and think and consider all this? Anybody got directions on how we're supposed to move this thing? No, you don't want to do that, especially when you're all excited. Why would you want to do that? You know, why would you want to, why would you want to turn the song off? Or especially when you're in the middle of the groove, you know? Why would you want to turn it off? You're just a party pooper. So they're going for it. And look what happens now. Something happens. Because you know what? Eventually, guys, eventually, though you're moving in emotions, though the worship's going, though the excitement is there, eventually God steps in. And eventually he says, <clears throat> Hey, excuse me, uh, I have a certain way this is supposed to be done in your life. And I know you're excited, and I know you're emotional, and I know things are looking on the up and up and everything. You're restoring your family. Your marriage looks like it's going to be restored. Your kids are doing good. Hey, but there's, there's something that i got to show you. you got to get the foundation here. you got to stick to my, my foundation that I provided for you. you got to stick to my instructions and my direction that I have given to you. And, and he tells Joshua, you guys remember? Joshua, you're going to go into the new land. And guess what, Joshua? You can't go to the left and you can't go to the right. Because the flesh is going to want to go to the left and go to the right, isn't it? The flesh is going to always want to try to find an alternative way to get there. And God knows that already. That's the way our flesh is. That's why we call it the flesh and lousy and we get sick of it. Because it always wants to go to the left to the right. But he says you stay on that straight path. You stay on that old, the old path. Yeah, the old one, he says. The boring one sometimes for some people. It could. I'm not saying the word of God is boring. I love it. But sometimes for some, for sometimes in our lives as Christians, it could be like, man, I'm not really getting anything out of this right now. But this is it right here. If you're not getting anything out of it, then you need to say, Lord, I'm not receiving anything this morning and I'm trying to read. All I'm thinking about is getting on the freeway early and all this kind of stuff. And all I'm thinking about is the coffee ready yet. And all I'm thinking about is all these other things. We got to pray. Lord, give me a clear mind. Speak to me. And I, I'll tell you guys, I'm, I'm constantly saying that prayer. I'm constantly in the morning, and I'm burned out, man. And I'm like, ah, David, what? He danced about the ark. The guy died. I heard the story a thousand times. And I'm like, Lord, speak to me. I need, it. I need something fresh. <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say to me about this dude who got killed, you know? It's a prayer. We have to, we have to be real with the Lord. So, verse 6. The songs are playing, everything, the hype's going. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, interesting. I like that example of the threshing floor over in Matthew chapter 3. It's a threshing floor picture of the, of the master, and he's, he's at the threshing floor, and he's sifting through everything. You know, the wheat and the chaff is what we know it as. God's way of separation. It's going to happen, guys. I hate to tell it to you. If you're on an emotional hype right now, the day of reckoning is going to come. <laughs> what I mean by that is the emotions are going to go away, brothers. And the excitement is going to go away sometimes. And that threshing floor is going to come where it's time to, you got to consider sometimes. God puts us up against the wall sometimes and says, what are you going to do now that you're being sifted through, now that you're being chiseled at, now that I'm causing a separation to take place in your heart. A separation of what? A separation of that which is going to burn and that which is going to remain. And there's a lot of analogies I can give, and I don't want to get too out of context with that. But the bottom line is the separation is going to take place, and I believe within every single one of us that time is going to come where we're going to have to sit there and say, well, am I okay with all I have, and that's God's word. Every one of us is going to have to answer that question one of these days here on earth. Am I okay with only having God's word alone. And we all have to be able to sit there and say, you know what, as much as I've read Jonah a thousand times, swallowed by the fish, uh, we try to figure out what kind of fish it might have been, and all these things, you got to tell yourself, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with studying Jonah again. And by the way, Jonah's one of my favorite books in the, in the whole Bible. It's got some crazy theological principles within it. But we got to come to the point where we say that I'm not, Lord, you know what, and this is where, you know, and I, I hate talking about my dad so much. Maybe one day he's going to see one of these videos and go, man, you talked about me a lot, Phil. But the bottom line is, is once that, that hype goes away, you know what I'm saying? You, and this is what happened to my dad. 
You're kind of like, all right, what else? What else you got, Lord? And the Lord says, well, I got, I got my word. Oh, yeah, yeah, but what else do you got? No. No, no, no. Yeah, this is it. This is what I have. The Bible tells us very clearly to the church of Philadelphia, those who have kept my word, says, those who have kept my word, they will be as pillars in my father's house. Those who have kept the word. So don't, we got to be careful and pray against the attack that the word becomes, you know, kind of whatever. You know, whatever that means. We've got to pray against that attack. The enemy wants us away from you. So look at the threshing floor they come to. Always going to come to the threshing floor. And Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. You see, God knew they put it on the cart. He, knew, he let it go even for a little while. He let it go for a while. Until it came to this point where God was going to show them, you know, no, I'll, I'll let you roll with it for a minute. I'll let you dig in the songs and the, the symbols and everything, David. That's cool. Because I know your heart wants, your heart is just wanting to take me back to the city. So I'll go with you for a minute. But I'm going to have to stop at some point. Because I got I to gotta bring this, this time. Where this time of reconciled, you know, type thing. And so God allowed for this ark. To fall. It wasn't no surprise. You know, we got, you know, I'm not, I don't want to become a pantheist in this, but what I'm saying is, it wasn't that much of a surprise that God knew this was going to happen. It was time, He wouldn't let it go that much further. And poor old Uzzah. <laughs> well, question How many of you guys, if you were Uzzah, would you have grabbed the ark? Okay, I'm like, I would have. <laughs> if I said, whoa, the ark's falling, bro. Woo. You know, poor Uzzah. Just doing what. Would he, or what would have been better for him to back up and go, whoa, watch it hit the ground? <laughs> then everybody would die. As soon as that thing opened up, you know, like Indiana Jones, where, you know, everybody, you know, it just flies to everyone. And, and that's, you know, when you look at the story of the scripture where that actually happened, you know, that's where they get it from, where they peeked open, you know, in that town. What was the town called? Uh, what, a Gibeah, I think? I don't know. And it opened and killed, what is it, Gil, 30 or 5,000 people or something? Yeah, or more than that. So serious stuff. So it's kind of like a catch-22 here. You know, do I let it fall and open up and kill everybody? <laughs> and I don't think he was processing all that. You know, he just did a natural reaction here. But this message of Uzzah wasn't, you know, I hate to say it. I don't want to say that Uzzah was just used here as a vessel of death. But it definitely sent a message to David. And the angel of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. See, the Lord says, it's time to stop and consider your ways, David. It's time to turn the music off, David. All right? Stop the worship for a second here, David. Stop the dancing and everything here, bro. It's time to think about what just happened and why did this just happen. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah to this day. So David stopped for a second and it totally displeased him. Freaked him out. What is going on here? I thought I was doing something good. My whole purpose of bringing the ark was to bring God back to the city and to put him in place that he would be worshipped. Why, how could something this tragic have happened? See, guys, the second we try. You know, I thought, you know who I thought about when I was reading this story? I thought about Peter. See, it was God's will that his son that he sent was going to go be sacrificed for all mankind, for the forgiveness of sins. But Peter stood back and chopped that dude's ear off. No, you ain't taking nothing, man. You ain't taking my savior. You know, and, and, and he got in the way a couple times, as a matter of fact. Right? No, this ain't going to happen to the point where what did Jesus tell him? Get behind me, Satan. What? I'm only caring about you, Lord. I'm only defending you, Lord. I'm only sticking up for you because I love you and, and you're, you're, the, you're my God. And you tell me, get behind me, Satan? What is that? It's just like, can you imagine? You're serving the Lord, and he turns around and says, you know, get behind me, Satan. What? See, I, I thought about those stories when I read that because, 
See, as the ark was the mercy seat, the, 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 the atoning where the sins would be atoned, and so is Jesus. Jesus had to go to the cross, and so nothing could get in that way of that. Nothing could get in the way of that. And sometimes we try to get in the way of that. Sometimes we try to, try to say, no, 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 you know, I, I, I'm not going to let this happen. And, and, and all the while, the Lord is just trying to break you. He's trying to bring you to the point where you will ask for forgiveness. He's trying to bring you to the point of the atonement, the mercy seat between the cherubs, the propitiation. But we put our hand up to it sometimes, and we try to catch it from happening. And we put our hand up to the Lord sometimes and say, no, I'm not going to let him get, the, get this close into my heart. I'm not going to let him get this close to my life. I'm not going to let him get this close to me. When he's saying, no, I need to be closer to you because I'm the propitiation. You need to let me all the way in. Don't try to stop what's happening here. And I'll, even though sometimes our motive, like Uzzah's, could be, okay, well, natural. It could be natural. I'm not going to do that. It's just not right. I'm not going to do this. I know I feel like God's telling me to do that, but I'm not going to do that. It doesn't make any sense. All that's going to do is make my life a lot harder. You know, what do you mean? Uh, you know, some, some of you guys got some killer testimonies. Pastor Jeff's got an interesting one. You know, with his marriage in the beginning, it went weird in the beginning. You know, and you can easily, no, I'm not going to get into this. But see, God has a way and he has a will and he has a plan for all of our lives. We can't get in the way of his work, guys. You can't try to catch, don't try to catch the ark, man. I mean, fortunately, let it fall. <laughs> It wasn't never meant for us to get in the way and try to prevent anything from happening. If, if the Lord is looking to enter into your life and to enter into your heart closer to you, you got you to go in it with open arms. He's, he's, the, he's the mercy seat. We have to let him in. When you find yourself at that threshing floor, that point of, of consideration, considering your walk with him, that's where you got to let your hands up, man. I don't know how many times I got to do that. I had to do it today. <laughs> Just put my hands up. Lord, all right. You know what? Your will be done then in my life. This calling that, I, that David has, this excitement that he has, I, I, we have the calling. We have the excitement. We want to bring the Lord close to us. But you know what, guys? We've got to remember something. He has that order in place. Don't, don't lose the order. Don't, don't think it weird. Receive, receive the mercy. Receive the grace. Hide yourself in Jesus. As he says it, be hidden in, in Christ. Let it go all the way, man. Don't, don't have any reservations because it doesn't look right. Don't have, don't have your hands up against them because it looks weird or it looks out of place. Hide yourself in him. Be presented before God through his son because that's the order that he gave. Nothing else. So don't expect too much out of yourself. I, I try not to. Don't, don't try to perfect yourself so much. And to say, you got to be super Christian, one, you know, whatever. I'm super Christian. No, that, that's not what's going to that's not what's going to do it. You could be super Christian outwardly. That's fine. And you could be standing next to someone who's on his face on the ground. And he's right. He's hiding in Jesus. Guess who the Lord sees? He sees the one who's hiding in his son, not the super Christian, <laughs> not the hyped up emotional one. And that's one thing, too, about emotions is you think by uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, by the way, they shout out of the. The temple, and by the way they worship, they think that's how, what justifies them. <laughs> it ain't about that, man. You could raise your hand as high as you want in worship, but your heart could be far from him. And he comes to you and he says, hey, give up the outward. G give up the outward and, and, and start to look at the inward because that's the order that he set. As he, as he gave them the ark, the order to talk to him, he's given us his son. That's the order. We can't change it, guys, so don't try. There's nothing else that needs to be added to you. You don't need to put another bumper sticker, another fish thing on. It's not going to make you any closer to him while you're driving. It's simple, easy. It's your heart. given over to him. Man, what I would, you know, and this is a battle for all of us today. More even a battle for us that live in these times today as Christian men. The battle is to not. The battle is to think that we can do something outwardly. Man, give it up, man. How about this? How about just surrender the inward? Surrender your heart continually is an okay thing to do. That's okay. Because that's where we meet and commune with him. That's what he told them. When you come here to this place, this is where I will meet and commune with you. So it's, oh, how many times? I would be going there every day. Anybody got any bull to kill? Let's do it. I want to go talk to God. Let's sprinkle the blood on that thing. And instead, he gives us his son. 
where we have continual access every day and every night to speak with him, to talk to him about the drama, man, <laughs> to talk to him about the mind trips and the spiritual attacks, to, to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your direction. I need, I need you to forgive me. I need, I need a sane mind right now, man. I'm getting weird. He gives us that access continually. That's why they say we are so blessed today to be able to have the propitiation. But we got to stick to his order. Be careful of all this. When we read about this kind of stuff, all it is to me, it's a warning for us. Be careful. Careful about the hype, the emotional stuff. So, verse 8. And, oh, I read verse 8. Verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Well, there you go, David. Now's a good time to ask that question. <laughs> it's funny. Because when the Lord's working on our, our lives this way, and he's trying to draw something out of you, and he's trying to bring you to a place of the threshing floor, and trying to separate something in your life and in your heart, Eventually, you're going to ask the question he wants you to ask. Then what do you want me to do now, Lord? <laughs> you know? See, if we would only start there, isn't it? If David would have just said at the very beginning, hey, look, I got an excellent idea. I'm hyped up, man. Check it out. How do we bring this ark out of here? Man, you would have had some holy man somewhere stand up and say, where are the Levites? Where are the Kohathites? You know, came up and gave all the, the directions and spelled out all the specifics. Because God would have met him. So David's now asking the question that he should have asked a long time ago. What now then, Lord? What do, you, what do you want? How can I do this? I really think we could save ourselves a lot of heartache if we start asking those questions now. <laughs> Lord, what do you want me to do in my life, man? What do you want me to do about this situation? Can you, can you tell me now? I'll wait, you know, and don't give God a, a couple hours. I'll wait a couple hours. No, I'll wait, Lord. I'll wait. I'm going to seek you and I'll wait. For an answer, because I don't want to move in the flesh. I don't want to move the in emotion. How shall the ark of the Lord come to me, he's saying. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord until him, unto him under the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now, as much as I was trying to find like this incredible study about Obed-Edom, I couldn't really find it. But the, I think the principle that for face value what I got was Obed-Edom, first of all, was, was a Levite. He, he was, it was rightful that the ark would be able to be in, in a guy like this, his possession. Um, the one thing I liked when I, was that last statement, and the Lord blessed him in all his household. Because after, after the day of separation happens, after this, the, the Uzzah dying and the, and the time of separation where God was saying, you know, we're at the threshing fl uh, floor here. You know, I have to show you guys you're doing it wrong. Then came the blessing. Then came when David stopped and he asked God, what should I do? He was directed to bring it here to Obed-Edom. Then Obed-Edom's house was blessed. And now in a time of sadness... In a time of, of David being afraid, he's displeased. Poor Uzzah, he's laying on the floor dead. You know, all this stuff going on that wasn't good. Then you see a blessing come out. Then you see a blessing come forth. Because God is saying, yeah, David, you should have asked that question a long time ago. I'm going to provide you a place to keep this thing right now. And then we see blessings come out of it. You see, I really love that about the Lord. And I want to believe that he's the same way today. And I think he is. When we find ourselves going down this road that we've read about David tonight. Knowing the word of God, one, because that's what Exodus was for them. The law, the way to do things. Getting a little emotional and a little hyped up. We all get into it, man. I'm not going to lie. We get emotional. Okay, we get upset. Then comes the day of separation. Then comes the time of reconciling. Then comes the time of God revealing. Then comes the questioning. Lord, what next? Then comes the blessing. Because when God, when we follow his order, when we follow God's specific way of doing things in life, that's why it's so important we rest in his word. Then comes the blessing. Then comes the, the oh, you know what? Even if the blessing is just a peace of mind, man, I'm okay with that. Trust me, I'm okay with that. Even if it's just a rest for my peace of mind, man, just so I can sleep good tonight. I am okay with that. See, God says, 
find it here. Come back to the word. Come back to what I've taught you through the word. Go back to the cross. Don't go weird. Don't go off into works of flesh and all these other things. Come back to the place where I've met you before. You guys remember meeting the Lord for the first time? Being forgiven of your sin? Being set free? What's wrong with going back there? I felt good that day. I, I felt like a, a ton of bricks was lifted off my shoulder. You know what? I want to feel like that right now too, as a matter of fact. So what's stopping me from going there? Well, just myself. That's the only thing stopping me from being set free every day. Yes, I know the Lord's working on our heart. Yes, I know it's ch chiseling. Yes, I know it's going to hurt. But you know what? It, it shouldn't be that heavy that we're feeling the burden of it because it's not for us to carry. I'm feeling the burden sometimes, man. It's heavy on the shoulder. But you know what? It's not my burden to carry. He doesn't want me to be weighed down by it. He says, cast all your cares upon me. And in that, we'll find blessing. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I just thank you for the promises of mercy and grace that you are the one who is the mediator. You're the propitiation for us. You're the mercy seat. And so, Lord, I think for all of us and trials of our lives and, and times of uncertainties and all this stuff, we want to just say, Lord, we want to be free. <laughs> we, want, we want the blessing. You know, we don't want to carry the burden. We don't want to see uh, things like what David, you know, he had to go through it, and it's for our learning, but, you know, he was displeased. He got hurt. He got scared. And, Lord, if we could save ourselves some of that, some of that displeasure, some of that fear, just by simply falling down on our knees before you, then, Lord, I think all of us want that. We want to meet you there at that point where we're humble before you. You hate a proud look. So, Lord, I think for most of us, when we study scriptures like this, we say, forgive us and keep us there. Keep us before you. Lord, let, fight our battles <laughs> and, and, and teach us and allow us to grow and become who you want us to be in our calling in this time. As David's going to learn and continue to learn how to become king, I pray that we would just hold on to you in this time of learning, that we wouldn't get so hurt or whatever that we walk away. So, Lord, sometimes I pray emotions are good, but remove the emotions, Lord, and help us to rest on the facts of your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.